Did you hear that? Get my six, because whatever made that scream is back in here somewhere. And note, you st that's a gray squirrel. You still hear birds. You still hear squirrels. I'm convinced that when him, her, it, or they are near, the wildlife continues to carry on because him, her, it, or they is merely part of the wildlife, okay? Um, I know I've got my own unique cryptozoological research methods, but they've allowed me to observe many things that others have not observed. And this is just merely uh, one of my theories. A lot of cryptozoologists claim, oh, you, you know, if Bigfoot Sasquatch is in the area, you won't hear birds, you won't hear nothing. Nope, not true. Now, if there's a mountain lion in the area or maybe a large aggressive bear, I do believe the other wildlife does go silent because those animals are predators. Um, Bigfoot Sasquatch... I'm still not convinced at all that he, she, it, or they are predators. Um, I, I, may, I mean, I guess to a degree, I don't know. I'm not here for that. I'm here to read. That was an extremely loud tree knock. Did you hear that? So we heard a scream and a tree knock. More tree knocks. All right, you know, it's almost Halloween. It's October 26th. I guess we're five days away. The veil obviously is getting very thin. So watch my six. You have no clue what you may see or hear in these videos between now and Halloween. I mean, there's some really mysterious events going on. And FYI, I'm gonna come up here later today and try to catch some more of it on camera. We've gotten a few things here in the, recent, in the last week or so. I'm gonna try to get some more. Now, big announcement before I do the reading. Before you go to bed tonight, Bigfoot Sasquatch Files Volume 5 might actually be available in Kindle on Amazon. And within 24 hours after that, it should be available uh, in print. So at least by tomorrow, um, or if you're in England, we have a lot of folks watching from England. By the time you wake up over there tomorrow in England, um, they should be there, okay? As is October nights, 31 Tales for the Halloween season. The link... To my books uh, on Amazon is in the description box below. All right, so there's some raindrops just right here now. Hear them? Wow, this is happening again. You remember about a month ago I got this on video. It wasn't raining anywhere at all except here, and now this is happening again. It's not raining anywhere else. Man, this place is weird. Okay, the reading. I'm not going to give you any backstory to this story because basically the story is the backstory to like... <laughs> tree knock. To like... You'll get it. It's a story called The Writer's Wife. Okay? Now, there's uh, there, this story is true and there's some truths in here that might not sound pleasant. Tough. I'm not editing on the fly any of this stuff out, okay? Don't be so sensitive if some of this stuff offends you, okay? Get over yourself. The writer's wife. This story is true. It has nothing to do with Halloween, perhaps other than the fact that if it hadn't happened, you wouldn't be reading this collection of Halloween-flavored short stories right now. Plus, ironically, it does begin in October. October 2011. I've gone back and forth from the Philippines to the U.S. a few times, all in ill attempts to grab and retain virtually any form of gainful employment in the U.S., which would allow me to bring my beautiful bride dearly and our son, then only months old, uh, or, or our then only months old son, Daniel, to the U.S. with me and give them the best possible life I could give them. The long and short of it is that it didn't work out. 
I had several strikes going against me. One, it was during the Great Recession. Two, I'd previously been a securities dealer and my Series 7 securities license had lapsed while I was away fighting in, fighting a war in Iraq. And no, that carried no leverage when trying to get on with any of the firms I called on after I got back. Three, I was strung out on more dope by way of the Army Hospital and the Veterans Administration after sustaining several injuries in Iraq, which led me to taking anything I could get my hands on, all of which made me not quite the guy at the top of anyone's hiring list. Out of options, I wasn't about to stay in the U.S. alone and send money back to take care of my family and hope everything worked out. You see, my wife and son were living in Mindanao, the southernmost island in the Philippines, an island riddled with multiple terrorist networks who specialize in kidnappings for ransom. And since my son was half white, he had a huge target on his head at all times. It was very common in Mindanao for people to keep their eyes on children whose, whose fathers were from the West, and even taxi drivers who were not part of any terrorist network would kidnap these kids once the fathers left the country, viewing it as easy money. Nannies and housekeepers did it all the time. I went back to Mindanao to be with my family. At least if I were there, someone would have to go through me to get my son. And let me tell you, that translates to someone would have to kill me to get to my son. And just as a terrorist in Iraq had found out, I don't die easily. When I got back to Mindanao, we left the Val City, where I'd always stayed with dearly before, and we went back to her province, which I'll not name here so as not to put any targets on any of her relatives' heads. We figured her large family would be a big help with our baby, and we were right as family is still important in the Philippines in Philippines culture, much like it used to be here in the U.S. It didn't take long before I sunk into a pretty deep depression. I was living in the jungle with no electricity or running water. We had a nine-month-old baby we were feeding off of roots and other wild edibles we could dig up in the jungle, and an ever-constant supply of fish and squid I would get from the fishermen, whom I helped carry boats in from the sea in the mornings when they returned from night fishing. Anyone who shows up to help pull in the boats is given a handful of fish or squid by the fishermen they help. At first, no one would give me any fish or squid because they assumed that since I was an American, I had to be rich and I didn't need the food. They couldn't understand why I even worked. In their minds, Americans don't need to work because they're all already rich. They believe our government just sends us all a check every week. However, once these fishermen saw me day after day, they began giving me free fish and squid and to their character, they gave me more than the locals. You big American, they would say. You need eat more food. One night, while drunk on tuba, a wine made out of the sap from a coconut tree that tastes like table vinegar, and crying about how I hated my life, dearly asked me what we could do to get to America. The economy's in the crapper, I told her. I've burned every bridge I ever had. The only way we could get there and raise our kid there and have good lives is if I were to make it as a writer. Then make it as writer, she said. That's crazy, I told her. Do you know how many writers actually make enough money to live off of their writing? No, she said. Neither do I, I said, after stopping to think about it for a minute, but I'm sure it's just a few. Then become one of the few, she said. What struck me about this whole conversation was how easily she thought I could do it. Did she really believe in me this much? Or was this one of those ignorance is bliss moments? I'm certainly not disrespecting my wife by saying this, but here she was, a third world poor 23 year old girl who'd grown up in a small fishing village in the jungle, who'd probably never used the internet until she went to Davao City to attend college for the few years that she could afford to do so by way of a not so poor grandmother, who by the way, quit paying her tuition, roughly $250 per semester in US dollars, and kicked her out when she found out she was dating an American. Why should she help support her? She had a rich American boyfriend. And no, Dearly never was able to go back and finish college because no, her rich American boyfriend wasn't so rich after all. That was me. Anyway, the next morning, while trying to sleep off a tuba hangover, which let me tell you is worse than a Schlitz malt liquor hangover by far, I got my answer. She believed in me. Wake up, she said. I opened my eyes and looked up and I saw my beautiful bride standing in the doorway. She had a notebook in one hand and three ink pens in the other. She threw it all on the bed and she said, write. We had no computer. We had no internet. We had nothing. But dearly had scrounged what few pesos we had, walked half a mile down the hill to the road, paid half of what we had to a tricycle driver who took her two miles into the closest thing resembling a town and back, 
and used the other half of what we had to buy me a notebook and three ink pens so I could write. And with those pens, I wrote until my hands cramped. And in that notebook, I wrote a novel called Off Switch. I would spend months going to an internet cafe, renting a computer for 15 pesos an hour, roughly 40 cents, when we had the money, to type it into a Word document. And these months were interspersed with weeks when we didn't have the money for me to rent computer time. And the whole time I was in those internet cafes, I was harassed by the locals because my nose was so long, my arms were so hairy, and my skin was so white. But I persevered because my wife wouldn't let me quit. It was a long, hard climb, but we made it. Eventually, and after being taken advantage of by a lot of douchebags in the mainstream media and the internet blogging world, who would publish my work without paying me, no, I am leaving out two names here because I'm not giving these guys any credit, blah, 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 was one of them, and blah, 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 who was an effing nutcase. <laughs> this guy got kicked off of social media. He's not even allowed on social media anymore. He used to steal my work. Uh, or just to name two, I finally started getting paid for my writing from afar, and in time, I was earning enough money from writing to come back to America, get an apartment, a car, furniture, and begin the visa process to bring my wife to America. She and our son stayed back for six months without me while I was in the U.S. doing this. I moved them across town once in Mindanao when we had confirmed a kidnapping plot on my son, and when we got word of another, I moved them to Manila where they lived for three months alone until I had returned to be with them for another six months before we came to the U.S. to live happily ever after. That was a loud one. Which is exactly what we've been doing. The reason I'm writing this story and including it in this anthology is because my wife, dearly, and our son, Daniel, deserve to have this story told and they deserve to have it preserved. The only reason I'm alive right now, the only reason I didn't drink and drug myself to death, or like far too many other veterans with PTSD, like myself, the only reason I didn't commit suicide is because of Dearly and Daniel. These two people, my wife and our son, literally loved me back to life. You see, when you have a creative mind, one of the biggest obstacles to get in your way is that creative mind. Sometimes it just thinks and thinks and thinks, and it thinks too much, and all the noise is blocking out anything good. But when I chop wood, the madness stops. It has to stop, or I'm liable to cut off a toe. That is so weird. I skipped an entire page. I was like, what does chopping wood have to do with that? Okay, I'm sorry about that, guys. Let me back up. Okay, these two people, my wife and our son, literally loved me back to life. Off Switch was never meant to be a novel. It was meant to be a suicide note. When I sat in that little bamboo shack alone because Dearly would take the baby to her mother's, allowing me time to write without interruption, I fully intended to use that notebook and those ink pens to leave my note, the one they'd find and cry about and ask themselves why they hadn't done more, etc. But it became a book. It became a book that allowed me to let it all out. It became a book that allowed me to begin healing, and Dearly's belief in me was the seed that grew into a mighty oak's worth of healing. Nearly 10 years as of this writing has passed since that day in October when I moved into the deep dark jungles of the Philippines with a hungry baby and a hungry woman and a hungry belly, convinced I would never see the U.S. again. Today, we own a piece of property nestled in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains just outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, that is bigger than the entire neighborhood in which I grew up. We live in a house on our property that is far too big for the three of us and a far cry from that little bamboo hut in Mindanao. We have a pond full of catfish, bass, and sunfish. We have gardens and we have fruit orchards that we planted ourselves. Hell, a couple of months ago, we went out and bought ourselves a brand new pickup truck. Oh, and yes, we have running water and electricity now, too. Today, our needs are met and we want for nothing. Our cups runneth over. And all credit, aside from being given to God, is also to be given to one person and one person only. And no, it is not me, the writer. It is the writer's wife. The end. Getting a big knock of approval back there. So guys, that's my favorite story in this book. And every word of it's true. So, hope you enjoyed the story. We've only got a few to go. Hope you're enjoying your October. Hope you're getting outside and getting some of the wonderful autumn air. Taking a look at the leaves if you happen to be blessed enough to live in a deciduous area. Um, be back for more next time. See you then.